merciful and mighty God in three persons Blessed Trinity Holy, holy, holy All the saints adore Thee Casting down their golden crowns Around the glassy sea Cherubim and seraphim Falling down before thee Who was and is and evermore shall be oh, worthy are you God our Lord God and King receive all the glory and honor and power for you have made all things oh, worthy are you God, our King and throne above? May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, worthy are you, God. Holy. shall praise thy name in earth and skies and sea holy 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 merciful and mighty god in three persons Oh, blessed Trinity, oh, worthy are you, God, our Lord, God, and King. Receive all the glory and honor and power, for you have made all things. Worthy are you, God, our King and throne above. May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, worthy are you, God. O oh, worthy are you, God. God, Lord, and King, receive all the glory and honor and power, for you have made all things. Oh, worthy are you, God, our King and throne above. May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, worthy are you, God. May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, worthy are you, God.
Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to a very special Christmas service this morning. This year, people around the world will be experiencing Christmas a little bit differently because of the pandemic. And especially in BC, we have some restrictions that limit a lot of the activities that we used to do. Things that we treasure so much in the past, we may no longer be able to do it this year. Things like going out to eat, going out on parties, going to concerts, festivals, all these different things, we may no longer be able to do it. And seeing people that we see usually around this time, like our relatives, our, our friends, brothers and sisters, we really want to spend time with these people during this time. We may no longer be able to do it this year. And not to mention some of the things like going out to shopping and going on vacations, those things will be dramatically cut down. And might I say, it's going to be a very quiet Christmas this year. It's a big change, isn't it? But for Christians, perhaps it's the first time in a very, very long time that we actually get to experience Christmas the way that it's actually supposed to be experienced. Where it's a time of waiting, where it's a time of crying out to God, where it's a time of anticipating His salvation, where it's a time where we really refocus and retune on what really matters during this time, on God. And so I pray that through this morning, through the scriptures, through the worship, through the Bible message, that you will be able to experience that, experience that retuning and refocusing before we enter our Christmas time and Christmas week. And to prepare for this, I suggest that you find a quiet space in your house. Don't be all busy, don't be running around, but instead for the next hour, really pay attention on God. And may you and your family experience the love and care of God a little bit differently through this worship service. If you're familiar with the book of the Bible at all, you will know that uh, the book of the Bible is made up of two very big sections. The first section is called the Old Testament, which is approximately that much, three quarters of the Bible. And then the second section is called the New Testament, which is that much, the last quarter of the Bible. And on my Bible, and I I'm sure with yours as well, these two testaments are separated by one single blank page right here. This blank page brings you from the last book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Malachi, to the first book of the New Testament, which is the book of Matthew. It also brings you from approximately 425 BC to the birth of Jesus Christ, a little bit over 400 years. This page, this page in history is called the intertestamental period the period between the Testaments. Calling this period a blank page and sort of representing it with just one sheet like this is, it's a little bit, it doesn't really do it justice. It, it, it can't be farther away from the truth. Because you see, for the Israelites, for the people who believe in God, that blank page, there's so much stuff that happened in there. This period is covered with violence, covered with suffering, covered with war, bloodshed. There was periods of hope and then disappointment and then hope and then disappointment and then despair. Kingdoms have come and gone. Rulers have come and gone. Yet God's kingdom never came. God's ruler never came. You see, the Israelites have been hoping for God's kingdom, for God's ruler, because that's what God promised in these last book of the Old Testament, in the prophets, what we call. God has been saying, I'm going to send your ruler. I'm going to send your king. But after all these kingdoms inside this blank page, they were constantly disappointed. At the end of the Old Testament, we ended up with the Babylonian Empire. And what happened here in this blank page was six eras, six kingdoms, six empires. We had the Persians, and then we had the Greek, and then we had the Ptolemy, which is from Egypt, and then we had the Seleucid, which is from Syria, and then we have the Maccabean, and then Rome. Where is the promised king? Where's the promised kingdom? All of these kingdoms have come and gone, but where is the promised one? Forget about the king. God, God didn't even send a prophet. God didn't even send a spokesperson. God didn't, God didn't even say a word. God didn't even let out a breath in this blank page of 400 years. For us, we know it's 400 years, but to the Israelites, it must have been forever. The reason why it was so difficult is because there were so many persecutions and sufferings going on. One of the more difficult eras is the Seleucid era. That must have been the most difficult time. The ruler of that era, uh, one of them was called Antiochus IV. Actually, the full name that he's given himself is Antioch, Theos Antiochus Epiphanes. 
Theos Antiochus Epiphanes, which means God manifests in the flesh. And you can sort of understand why it's been so difficult. In 172 BC, Antiochus IV he raided Jerusalem. Basically, he was so fed up with the politics, so fed up with the Jews, so fed up with the religion, he raided Jerusalem. He murdered over 100,000 Jews, and he sold 40,000 of them as slaves. And during this period of time, Antiochus IV, he had this single mind focus to completely eradicate the Jewish faith, completely remove them from planet Earth. And so what he has done is he has banned, banned the observance of Sabbath, which is the weekly celebration of remembering God. He banned the celebration of feast days and Passovers and festivals. He placed guards around the temple so that nobody can go in to sacrifice and worship. Can you imagine that? Having guards, security guards blocking people from churches. He burned and, and nearly destroyed every single copy of the Hebrew Bible, and he banned the rite of circumcision. Circumcision was the act of dedicating your children to God, and he banned it. And what happened was, um, there was a story that there's two women who secretly circumcised their children, secretly. But Antiochus found out what he has done. I don't know if you can believe this, but what Antiochus IV has done is he found out these women circumcised their children, he killed the babies in front of the mothers, hung the babies around the mother's neck, paraded them around Jerusalem so that nobody will do that thing again, paraded all the way to the Jerusalem city wall and pushed the woman down to their death. A year later, Antiochus IV, he converted the temple of the Israelite God, you know, the God of heaven and the God of earth, to a temple for Zeus. He, he, he erected statues of Zeus inside God's temple. He sacrificed pigs in the temple. He defiled the temple. He forced the priests to eat pigs, and he forced the people to eat pigs. At that point, if you were a believer at that point, you had a choice to make. Do you choose your faith? Do you choose your Hebrew God? Do you choose your culture and your history, or do you want your life? And many Jews died making that decision. Where's the promise? kingdom? Where's, where's the promised king and, 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 and ruler and, and Messiah? Where, where is he? There was a little bit of hope during that time. Shortly after that, there was an elderly priest named Mattathias who lived in a village just a little bit northwest of Jerusalem. You see, when a Syrian official tried to enforce, you know, those heathen sacrifices, bowing to Zeus and stuff like that, this um, uh, Mattathias, this elderly priest, he killed that Syrian official. He killed all the Jews who betrayed the Israelite God, and then he fled to the mountains and with his five sons and his family. But to his surprise, thousands of faithful Jews joined him, and they began what is now called the Maccabean Revolt, led by his three sons. Shortly after that, in 165 BC, December 25th, these men had retaken Jerusalem, they reclaimed the temple, and, and, and they rebuilt the biblical worship. And this event is still celebrated now as the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. And, and a little bit after that, after a little bit of fighting, a little bit of war, the Jewish people finally received their independence in 143 BC or around, for around 70 years. And so you were thought, oh, God has delivered us now. We're free. We're finally, you know, ruling ourselves. We're independent. But their victory and independence didn't really bring them the peace that they longed for. You see, now other than fighting the people outside, they're fighting the people inside. They're fighting who has the right to be a king, who has the right to be a high priest. Some people are saying, so only the line of David should be the king, only the line of Aaron should be the priest. And now there's all kinds of conflict underneath the surface. There's bitterness, there's division, there's even civil war within the nation. Is this the, the, the promised kingdom? That, that, that's what God's promised? Is that the peace that God promised? Well, whatever little peace that they enjoyed didn't stay for long. In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey, he swept through the Middle East with his army and conquered Syria, and then his millions and millions of horsemen and army came to the walls of Jerusalem, gates of Israel. <laughs> and for whatever bold reason, the king of Israel at that time decided that he's going to lock Pompey out. He's not going to let him in, and he's going to refuse to surrender. And Pompey was pissed off. He was enraged. He took the city by force. He wiped the city. And hundreds and thousands of Jewish people died. And the Israelites obviously were no match for the people of Rome. And so Israelites once again lost their independence, which is now the sixth tithe now. 
they're now once again under foreign rule. And to add insult to injury, Pompey, after he defeated the Jews, he, he paid a visit to the temple. He went into the Holy of Holies. That, that's the place supposedly God would manifest his presence the most inside the temple. And this, this foreigner, this enemy of God entered in and he came out unharmed. He came and nothing happened to him. And, and so you can imagine how frustrated and how mad and how desperate and how, how, how angry the Jews are at the Romans. But they, there's nothing they could do. In 40 BC, which is now very close to the New Testament, Herod the Great was assigned to be the governor, the king of the Jews, so to speak. He was able to calm some divisions and, and some conflicts, and he rose to power over the Jews, but he was not accepted by the Jews as their king for a couple of reasons. First is because he was from the Edomite descent, which is considered an outcast by the Jews. And also because he heavily leaned towards the Rome in, 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 in politics and government. He didn't really favor the Jewish people. He leaned towards the Roman government. But he did try to gain the favor of the Jews. He built a new temple for them, uh, but, but it was no use because it, it couldn't cover his, his, his personality, his cruelty, and his evil nature. Because you see, Herod the Great was, was very, very suspicious, highly insecure, very cruel, murderous, violent, and he would do anything he could to retain in power. He even, he even killed his own wife and children in order to stay in power. And so you can imagine when, do you remember the three wise men? When the three wise men came to Herod and asked him, where is the newborn king of the Jews who want to worship? And you can imagine what Herod is feeling. He's highly insecure and he's struggling and he's confused and he's, he wants to get rid of it. So that's what he did. He went on to kill all the children under two years old to eliminate the possibility of this newborn king of the Jews. And during this time, that's not it. The Israelites were not fighting against sort of outward persecution, you know, swords and fists and punishment. That's not it. There's also cultural and religious sort of internal persecution that's coming. Because you see, back then when the Greek ruled the region, the Greek empire, Alexander the Great, he made it his agenda to spread Greek all over the Middle East. That's called Hellenization. Basically, he wants to spread the Greek custom, the culture, the religion, the language, the clothing, the, the, all the currency and all the philosophy and art. He wants to spread it and make that the standard of living. So basically, Greek was the thing. And obviously there was a lot of benefits and developments during this time, you know, Greek became the predominant language and so you can understand that, you know, art and literature probably flourish. The Greek currency became the standard and so is the way of measuring things. Entertainment from Greek, you know, art, theater, culture, sports, uh, philosophy, music, be, like spread through like a storm. But to the faithful Jew, this was a battle, this was a temptation. This was a battle for their own identity, you see. They're now fighting against Greek gods and goddesses. They're fighting statues and, and temples and myths and religions and magic and cults. And they can't turn a corner without seeing that menacing statue of Zeus or, or that enticing statue of, of Aphrodite. And they're fighting the temptation from the culture, you know, those arts and entertainment and theater. That's more fun. That's more appealing, that's more sensual, that's more attractive, more entertaining. But it's not Jewish, it's not godly, and it's not holy. And so out of this period, the Hebrew, the Hebrew uh, generation, they're fighting for their identity. And the question is simply this, uh, do you go with the God or the gods? Are, are you a Hebrew or are you a Greek? Do, do you keep your identity or go with the flow? Or, or do, do you keep your values and, and, and your belief system and your religion or, or you keep your life? And so compared to the battles and the warfare and the swords and fists and the revolt and all that kind of stuff, this was another kind of monster. This was like a hidden kind. This was like a poison that would, that would kill you from the inside and without you even knowing, you would come out as a different person. Not even Hebrew anymore. And so it has been 400 years, 400 years in this blank page, 400 years of persecution and darkness and revolt and war and bloodshed, as well as battling the culture or maybe even getting brainwashed to become ungodly, to a way of living that there's no God and no hope, there's no promise, there's no kingdom, 
No nothing. What is a blank page to us you have to remember is an eternity for them. They didn't have the rest of this. They thought this would go on forever. And if you're a Jew, if you're a Hebrew at that time, you, there's nothing you can do. You just wait. You just wait and you endure and you wait and you hope and you wait and you wait for the promised kingdom. Where, where's the promised kingdom? Where's the promised king? Where's the promised Messiah? But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Come to the away. 
now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased.
When Jesus grew up, he left Nazareth and went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Four hundred years of suffering, four hundred years of silence, and four hundred years of waiting. Kingdoms rise and fall, rulers come and go. There was Persia, there was Greek. There was Egypt, there was Syria, there was the Maccabees, and there was the Rome. The only thing that the Israelites could do under all this persecution and suffering is just to hold on. Hold on for dear life, hold on to what God said, what he promised through the prophet. Back here. One of whom is Isaiah, from which we just read. They, they, they're just holding on to this one day. There's this thought, there's this belief for them that this one day, the earthly kingdoms, all these rulers that's going to pass, God's kingdom would finally come. The wars would stop. There's no, no more unjust ruling. There's no more warfare. There's no more bloodshed. And this Messiah is going to rule. He's going to be wise. He's mighty. He is righteous and he's just and he delivers peace forever. But they didn't know when. They didn't know how long they had to wait, but all they could do is wait. Well, I mean, what else could you do? And so it's in this waiting that Jesus was born, silently, unnoticed. There's no fanfare. There's no celebration. There's no massive party. He was born in a manger, born in Bethlehem, a small town in Bethlehem, born in a manger. A manger is a place for animal food. The only group of people that came to celebrate was shepherds. These guys were common people. The mother was a nobody called Mary, and the father was your average citizen. is a carpenter called Joseph. And when Jesus was born, he was almost murdered by Herod the Great. Think about it. The Messiah was almost murdered as a child. And so the father and, and, and the mother, he, they brought Jesus and they fled like refugees. They fled to Egypt. Refugees? The Messiah fled as a refugee? And then when Herod the Great died, they came back to this small village, Nazareth. Nothing spectacular, nothing fancy. He, just, he was brought up like any, any boys, any, any children like from the Jewish tradition. Can you imagine that the Son of God, this Messiah, this ruler is going to come in this way? Like, I think for, the, for, for, for Israelites, they certainly is not expecting that. It's, it's, it's almost anticlimactic. It, it's just so normal. It's so average. It's so ordinary. And, and maybe that's why, you know, we don't hear anything about his upbringing anymore until 30 years later when he launched his public ministry. Matthew, one of the gospel writers, he records it this way. He says, Jesus leaving Nazareth, the, the place he was brought up, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Do you remember these names? Zebulun and Naphtali? Because Matthew, Matthew certainly does. Because he says this, he says, uh, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah back then might be fulfilled. Listen to this, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nation, a Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Matthew connected the dots right away. Matthew was like, hey, this is, this is the promise. This is where Messiah was supposed to come from. This is the place. This is where the kingdom begins. This is where the kingdom is inaugurated. This is where the king begins his reign. This is where hope begins. 
and, and, and notice, notice how Matthew only quotes two verses of the prophecy by Isaiah. Because uh, uh, like he didn't need to quote the whole thing because the, the Israelites, they, they would have committed this to memory by now. Do you remember what it goes, how it goes? It goes, for to us, a child is born. This is the child. A son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And this person, this person's name, this nobody that you, you just missed out on, this Jesus is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And on him, this government and of peace will be no end. And on his throne of David, over his kingdom, he's going to establish it. And he's going to uphold it with justice and righteousness from now until forevermore. This is the child. This, this is where it happens. And when Matthew looked back, he must have thought, like his mind must have been blown, that this was the fulfillment of the prophecy. This was the turning point for the Jewish people. It, it, this is the turning point for humanity. This was the moment, 400 years, 400 years of waiting over here. It's all funneled to this point. In fact, the whole Old Testament, all of the history of mankind, all funneled to this point at this location, all of this waiting, all this suffering, all this time, landed to this point in time. And so what happens next is very important. What happens next? From that time, Jesus began to preach. The word for preach here is proclaim in the original language is proclaiming, declaring. The first thing that God does after all of this waiting and silence and, and, and waiting and silence is God speaks. God speaks. And what is the first thing he says? He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And obviously, what did you expect? The king is here, so the kingdom is here. The king, it's at hand. It's, it's very near. It's at arm's reach. And, and to some people, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This phrase is a good news for them because they have been waiting and waiting for so long. Finally, the Messiah is here to inaugurate this kingdom. And there's government and there's peace and there's righteousness and justice from this time to forevermore. Finally. But for some people, this phrase is a double-edged sword. Because you see, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. For some of us, you know, the word repent, we've gotten a little numb to it. But re repent is not, it's not feeling sorry. Repent is not just making a prayer, making, making a confession. That, that's not just to it. Repent is essentially turning back to God, turning away from, from, from the things that lead you away from God and turn towards God. Repent is realizing that we have lived in darkness and in this turmoil and we've been stuck in this mess for so long that when the chance comes, when there's a person that tells you this is the new, you can start over. Repent is realizing, oh, this is the opportunity. I got to grab hold onto this for dear life. And so you hold on to God for dear life. This is repent because the new kingdom is here. The new way of living is here. The new king is here. And so if you... If you have had enough of wandering, if you have had enough of exile, if you have had enough of being tossed around or suffering under foreign powers, persecution or darkness, Jesus said, this is the time for you to come home. This is the time for you to turn away from the world, turn away from those old governments, turn away from yourself because you know yourself doesn't satisfy you. Then turn to me the source of peace and hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn to me, the king. It, it seems very fitting during this time to use an analogy to illustrate this. Just a while ago, November 3rd, was the US presidential election. This is a little bit different of an election because the votes had to be counted, we had to wait. A few days after the election, it was, it was very, very clear who won and who lost. 
according to custom and you know tradition, the one who lost was supposed to concede, admit defeat, concede gracefully and sort of graciously, begin the transition process as smooth as possible so that the old administration can go to the new. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, the Messiah has come. The kingdom of heaven is here. So this is the new administration. The old, you got to make way. And the old, the people in the old or the people in the citizens, they got to acknowledge it. They got to welcome the new, welcome the way of the new government. And as is the response to U.S. election, when there's a new ruler in place, when there's a new king in place, there are usually two groups of responses. There's a group that wants to delay the process as long as possible, holding onto whatever power they have, refusing to concede and, 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 cry, and re refusing to say, I'm defeated, you know, crying foul, there's lies, there are false news, court, going to car, we're gonna fight, we're gonna fight doing all they can to stop the transition. There's a group of people that's like that. But there is another group of people. This group is so fed up and so sick of the darkness and evil and sin that they immediately, immediately welcome the new king and they begin this transition. And they say, we're going to welcome this new government. We're going to welcome this new legislation. We're going to welcome these group of people and we're going to align ourselves to them. To them. We're going to get ourselves ready for this new government and we can't wait. Let's repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. And Christmas is a season like this. It's a season of invitation, if you want to put it that way. Messiah has come. The king has already arrived. The kingdom of heaven has begun. The invitation for you is to turn to him. What's our response to you? Do we welcome the king or do we go to court against him? Do we hold on to those old rules and old ways of doing things or do we align to the new legislation and the new policies? Are we holding on to the old chapter or do, are we ready for a new, brand new book? Are we still lingering in darkness and unrest or even finding pleasure in the old? Or are we desperate for the light and for the peace that the new promises? I'll give you a person that um, we can use as a reference for how to graciously you know, concede and joyfully accept the new. This is Apostle Paul. He writes this in Galatians um, chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. No longer I who lives. He has surrendered. He has conceded. He says, Christ lives in me now. This is the new ruler. He says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He has conceded, he surrendered. He says, Jesus Christ, you be the Lord, you be the King. He also says somewhere else, he says in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. The old is gone, the new is here, the king is here. Repent, turn to him for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Will you welcome the new king? Will you follow the new king? And this is the invitation in Christmas. And I understand, for, for some of us here, if, we don't, if, if we're not sick of the darkness, if we're not sick of the struggles of the old, and if we're, if we're not tired of all this stuff, in fact, if we even enjoy the old, the old government, the old way of doing things, Christmas for you is an extended holiday. Christmas is dinner. Christmas is gifts and presents and carols. Another year passes by, another celebration, nothing else really changes. But for those of us who desperately need a savior, who is so sick and tired of the old, who is so fed up with darkness and sin, who wants to start, who is longing for a chance to start over, who needs hope and peace. Do you need hope and peace? Christmas is the good news that you need. Christmas is the gospel that you need because Jesus Christ is the good, good news that we need. Emmanuel is the good news that we need. God with us is the good news that we need. God with you, God with you is the good news that you need. This person called Wonderful Counselor, his wisdom and guidance is the person you need. Mighty God, this pow his power is the thing that you need. Everlasting Father, the comfort and care and compassion of a father is the thing you need. Prince of Peace, peace.
peace is what you need. So Jesus Christ is who you need. And he's here. He's here. You can turn to him and welcome him. So today, I want to make a prayer for us. If you're ready to welcome him, if you're ready to joyfully and willingly concede and surrender to him, even for the first time, I want to pray for you. I'm going to do this prayer in two parts. The first part, I'm going to pray for those that is making that decision for the first time ever in your lives. You've never heard of this king. You want to try this out. You want to commit to him. I want to pray for you first. And secondly, I'm going to pray for those of us that have already made that decision. Those of us who are already Christians, I'm going to pray for you second. Why don't we pray together? Let's pray. God, we want to pray for those people that are listening to this message, listening to the, the meaning behind Christmas for the first time. Those people, we are tired and we are, we're, we're tired of the darkness, we're tired of the brokenness. We're tired of getting thrown around by different, different rulers and kings and lords over our lives and we're so tired of serving all these other idols and gods that don't really, don't really satisfy us. They don't give us that peace and the hope and the satisfaction and it doesn't fulfill that longing inside. God, we want to pray for those people today. God, we want to experience this new kingdom. We want to experience the peace and the hope that this new king offers. We want to experience the guidance from this wonderful counselor, the power and protection from the mighty God. We want to experience the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. And so God, we welcome you into our lives. We haven't had have everything figured out yet, but God, we want to try to go with this new kingdom. Would you help us to follow you? And God, we also pray for those that are already believers, those that are Christians. There is still darkness and evil in, in, in our lives that we're, we're still unwilling to surrender, unwilling to concede. God, today we want to make a decision to try to concede, to try to surrender as much as we can because we know, we know that you are who we need. We need you to rule over us. We need that wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father. You are the person that we wish, we hope to satisfy all of us. So God, would you help us to concede? Would you help us to surrender? Would you help us to live in this new kingdom and under this new king and help us to continue to follow you, Emmanuel, God with us. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, I'm going to invite you to stand. Let us celebrate the new king and welcome the new kingdom. See.
Receive the benediction and the sending from Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says to his disciples, He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this concludes our Christmas service today. We hope to see you next week in another special service that we're going to have. It's going to be our year-end Thanksgiving service. And we're going to invite you to join us in worship and also counting the blessings of God that He has shown to us in this past year. Church, we wish you a merry, merry Christmas. God bless.
Went forth. 